Welcome to World at Work TV. I'm Allison Avalos, and I'm joined today by Kurt Nelson of the Lantern Group and James Brewer of Eli Lilly. And we're talking about the use of behavioral science in incentive plan design, fascinating topic. So James, can you first start off by talking a little bit about how, e how Lilly USA is using behavioral science to cause some radical change with regards to sales plan design? And what are some of the drivers behind that change? The first and most important aspect that we've done is in the last seven years, um, we shifted our core strategy across the company. Um, so from an incentive compensation, uh, it's always critical to match your incentives to reflect your strategy so you're motivating the individuals against corporate strategy or brand strategy. Uh, we had a major shift about 2010, and I came into the role in 2011. And at that time, it was an opportunity to really assess what were we doing. We quickly realized the strategy shifted in our incentive compensation hadn't. And so it was an opportunity to start from ground zero and build up. So the first was we had a shift in our strategy. Secondly, because of that shift, we had to make this change. And I reached out to Dr. Nelson to ask, how do we approach this? How do we approach it? not just from a mathematical or an analytical, which historically we had done, but are there some additional science and additional learnings to drive enhanced motivation to our field sales? So what are some of the behavioral science principles that were used? So we used a, a motivational model called the four drive model, mm -hmm. which basically uh, was developed by a couple gentlemen from Harvard, Lawrence, uh, uh, Paul Lawrence, and then Nitin Norea. Uh, and they developed this component that said, Employees are motivated by four underlying drives, drive to acquire and achieve, drive to bond and belong, drive to create and challenge, and then this drive to defend and define. And so we use that as a lens uh, to look at all of the incentive plans that, that they had been developing as well as some of the other total reward components that they were doing. Uh, and we use that as kind of a foundational. But then we also brought in other psychology and behavioral economic principles, some things around hedonic motivation, pieces around idiosyncratic fit, uh, elements of loss aversion, uh, some communication components around how th things were framed. How did you communicate that incentive plan in order to make sure that people understood it and they were motivated by it? How did we bring in social proof concepts? How did we use uh, elements in regards to thinking about how people were actually changing their behavior uh, to align with that strategy that James was talking about? When we looked at our strategy, what was important for us is to see that it was a significant shift. And then being able to marry up some of the four drive models and enhance those. So the design principles, uh, one matched our strategy, but also we created levers of motivation across four different components. And we were, historically, we'd had one big lever, it was acquire. It's a classic lever and in incentive compensation. The more you achieve, the more you get. Well, that works, but you're missing some other additional options. And that's where we brought in the bond, the defend. We also enhanced from a um, competency and, and um, comprehend and being able to go broader across all those different motivators while still aligning to our company strategies and shifting the organization. And we brought it in from the perspective, it wasn't just on the incentive compensation. We looked at the total rewards component because right. you can only address certain components within the incentive compensation plan and we knew we had to go broader. So we looked at things like their achievement trips. We looked at components such as their non-cash rewards. We looked at um, other rewards. They have a master performer um, program for their, for their district managers. And we shifted some of the work within that in order to address some of those drives as well as address some of those behavioral principles that we talked about. And that's why it's really a combination of reward and recognition. Mm -hmm. Some of our recognitions that used to be rewards, we don't reward, we recognize. Because we found that that alone can be a very powerful motivator for an elite group. And we're not trying to ship them off to some expensive bore bore or something like that. We can bring them right into Indianapolis to our headquarters and they can partner with our most senior leaders and exchange ideas and learn where the company's going. And that elite group have an opportunity that historically they didn't. And that has become a very powerful motivator for individuals. Now, these are individuals that have proven leadership over time, the master performers. Yeah. 
But we're looking at all of, those, all of those type of rewards and saying, is it really a reward or should it be a recognition? So we're continuing to evolve and, and study this. And uh, what I think has been most powerful for us is as a company recognizing that these type of, this behavioral science can be applied not just to, for incentives. We're actually expanding it across to other areas, functional areas across the organization. So what are some of the specific modifications that resulted from this work and then what has been the impact? Let me share some of the key strategies. Uh, the three key strategies, we're going to, we were going to shift from being focused on our product, which we have great products, innovation, best in class, to recognizing that we need to be customer focused, hyper focused. I know that sounds a bit trendy or or uh, transactional, we actually said, no, this is actually gonna be real. Uh, that meant we had to bring in voice of the customer surveys into our incentive design, which we hadn't done before, at a fairly high component, so the cash component. We also recognized that we collectively were better or could impact uh, results in a better way than an individual. So we have a team-based incentive compensation program. We do not have an individual-based incentive. And that was a large shift, but that was also a recognition of our core strategy. M to parallel what's going on in the healthcare marketplace, where healthcare providers today don't have individual decisions, they work in integrated systems collaboratively to create better patient outcomes. We actually are mirroring that because one sales representative talking to one doctor can't change an integrated system or the outcome of a patient, but collectively, collectively our teams could. It also brought in this bond and belong part being a team, and so we were able to, to tap into that, but also this uh, element of fairness. And within, within Lilly, there was a perceived unfairness. Now, fairness is not a motivator in and of itself. If you have a fair compensation plan, it's not driving anybody at the end of the day going, wow, I'm really excited about this because it's fair. The fact of the matter is, though, if it's unfair, it becomes a really big demotivator. And so by moving to that district team level, there were some measurement and other components that we were able to reduce that perception of uh, unfairness and reduce that down to a part where it wasn't such a big deal anymore. What kind of results have you seen from these changes you're talking about? Well, I have quite a few different. Um, from a business perspective, we've had seven consistent years of meeting or exceeding business plans. Now that's a correlator. correlator. I don't know if I could sit here and tell you it's causation because there's so many different aspects. There's not a lot of different uh, multi-channel promotional activities, but it's a nice correlation that when we made the change, we've been consistently successful. On a less just business results, I can tell you some of the cultural changes we've seen. From a team perspective, if a sales manager who has a team goal, historically, if they had an open territory that may have been empty for a leave of absence or a medical leave or something of that nature, when we were ranking one territory to another, that empty territory, if a sales manager asked a representative, go cover those top performing or those most important customers, that sales rep would sort of grimace because that is a territory they're competing against. Why am I doing that? Now as a team, that's important to them. So in essence, what we've done culturally, if we shift it from playing PGA golf to like NFL football or soccer or baseball, we're a team. And I thought it was interesting, very early on, many individuals said, are you gonna lose competitiveness? Well, again, using the parallel, I know none of the football teams that I watch are less competitive because they have one scoreboard. We still recognize individuals' performance at end of year with, promotion, with promotions and merit, but when it comes to incentive compensation, we have a team component. Again, from a strategy perspective, deploying into a healthcare market, it works extremely well. And on a more tactical component, I know we, we shifted some of the communication work that we were doing. So we, we enhanced some of the communication and brought in some of those principles around how you frame it and how you, uh, the graphical components within it and making sure that we weren't overloading them cognitively so that they're, they're doing things. And so uh, James was telling me that beforehand, the retention level of understanding of the compensation plan around 40% mm -hmm. somewhere in that vicinity. They did a, a survey a couple years ago in 2015 and it was up to 84%. Mm -hmm. So 
by changing how we communicated the plan, even though the plan is actually really complex. Um, but by able to do that by bringing in graphic components, by making sure we were framing it right, by making it a campaign approach so that we weren't overburdening at one point and saying, here's all the information uh, and putting out, here's part of the information and here's some more and here's some an infographic to kind of highlight different things. We were able to expand how well people understood it, which then you know, ultimately leads into driving that strategy because now they understand how that the plan aligns with the strategy and what they need to do in order to drive that. And I think we all acknowledge that change within organizations is tough, especially um, if you're an organization that might struggle through some of the aspects of that change. When you think about kind of decision processes around this, I, I think it's it's easy to understand kind of how the behavioral science affected the choices you made in terms of what to change, but it also sounds like it was a big part of how you executed. One of the things that we did at the very beginning was we brought the leadership group together. Uh, and, and we did it very purposefully in order to educate them. And part of that was using this component of anchoring, right? They had an anchor of what they thought was an appropriate way to, to incent or to reward individuals. And what we had to do is reset that anchor. And so we were very purposeful in how we approached it. And we, we did some educational component around the Ford Drive model. We brought in some of these behavioral principles and really engaged them in actually thinking through their own thought process on it. So we were using some of those behavioral science principles to, to educate and bring the executive leaders along with that, which I think was a really important part of, of actually getting this accepted and brought into the entire organization. Thank you both. Thank you. For World at Work TV, I'm Allison Avalos.